good afternoon good evening i welcome you all to the third webinar of the year on circular economy on the topic recycling and waste management crisis across the world which is being brought to you by eco civilization in association with waha women my name is rajni vohra i am founder of waha women and i am feeling really honored to be joined by a renowned leader founder and curator of eco civilization on river former deputy prime minister of slovenia and eu transport commissioner valerija bus and also being assisted by pina maya as co-host we are also having three illustrious guest speakers with us on panel who are here to share their knowledge experience and talk about their project and initiatives on recycling and waste management in a short while from now let me also share with all our viewers that we have already hosted two webinars on circular economy in past two months out of the total 12 webinars of the series which are available to watch on the website of eco civilization we are organizing this series as part of endeavors to create an awareness and sensitization drive to make a transition from take make use pro mindset to something as sustainable as circular economy wherein we intend to put across and reiterate the significance of circular economy broadly addressing why bringing up circular economy has become need of the hour and how we can proliferate this concept not only at industrial level but also at social and individual level so let me kick off this interesting session by inviting violeta bus ma'am to say a few words thank you very much ranji and welcome everyone to uh, this new edition of uh, eco civilization talks Uh, on circular economy. Uh, this is uh, one part of a larger uh, eco-civilization movement, uh, which uh, is growing with uh, its uh, users, with its members, with uh, people who sense that there is something in the air, something new and fresh emerging. Uh, and uh, we are here together uh, to put the name on it. to sense it together and develop it together and finally live it uh, because the future is in our hands and uh, nobody else will develop it for us so the real invitation of eco civilization movement is that uh, we create together a new shared destination uh, where we want to live the way we want to live and uh, i do believe that uh, eco civilization in action is one of those elements that brings us an awareness how certain topics are emerging all over the world and we share the same passion for them we share the same dedication and we are together looking for the most efficient ways for its manifestation circular economy is certainly a new business model that is emerging on a global scale and all the exciting stories that are brought to us by Ranji and her team by Pinamaya and the whole eco civilization movement are really proving this point so i'm very much looking forward to three new stories uh, that will enrich our repository of positive circular economy stories that already exist on the webpage of eco civilization and uh, cannot wait Uh, to get inspired yet another time because every time these stories are so amazing and they show us how much we can as individuals as teams uh, actually deliver also on a local level so ranji i'm really really happy to be again with you here and uh, let's hear the stories thank you valeta for giving us a brief overview of eco civilization and we are absolutely ready to dive into this exciting and knowledge filled session with our brilliant speakers so without any further ado let me introduce our first speaker of the day axel daru joining us from france axel joined the public policy affairs department of cto in 2018 after experiences in the high administration and advisory firm for the public sector he works very closely with all the sectors of the packaging value chain in particular on the circular economy package the european plastic strategy the circular plastic alliance the national acts on plastic packaging the new circular economy action plan within the european green deal and epr projects around the world 
He is also lecturer on circular economy and European affairs for the University of Paris and ESSE, International Business School. And now we want uh, Excel uh, from you. We want to hear from you. So over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks a lot for these invitations. Uh, I hope we will have a fruitful exchanges on circular economy. Um, indeed, uh, so I'm from, I'm from CTO, which is a, a, an extended producer responsibility organization, uh, the largest one in Europe uh, regarding uh, packaging and, and paper. And so I, I made the choice to have a presentation today on the key role of the EPR. So to really explain what is an EPR and what are the concrete uh, goals, uh, targets and vision of the extended producer responsibility across the world. And with a concrete example of CTO uh, with some figures and projects. I'm going to share right now my screen. Okay. I hope you see all the screens. I'm going to put it in full screens. Here we go. So yeah, as you all know, we have a lot of uh, regulations and a lot of pressure from, uh, from the regulatory authorities across the world uh, to, to have a more and more circularity on, on plastics and on packaging. Uh, regarding uh, the accelerations of the circular economy across the world. And we have uh, so pressure, of course, in Europe uh, with the EU uh, single use plastic directive uh, since two years. We have uh, now a, a plastic pact in Canada linked to a strategy that we have since uh, 2018 uh, on the zero plastic waste strategy. We have more and more pressure in the uh, US uh, regarding circular economy. Uh, with implementations of uh, external producer responsibility and deposit return system uh, across the states. The new administrations uh, had a lot of pressure since the beginning, so since a few weeks, uh, to have a, a new uh, policies on, on plastics. As you know already, also we have uh, some, uh, some pressure in, in India, uh, specifically to, to put in place uh, some, some EPRs depending of, uh, of, some of the products but mainly to accelerate the circularity of, of plastics. Uh, the, China uh, took the example of, uh, of the EU regarding the, the plastic strategy, so to ban uh, some, some plastic, but also uh, to limit the importations of, uh, of plastics since four years. And we have now new regulations at the global level with the ban conventions on the exportations of uh, plastic waste. And more and more, we have new regulations and commitments, such as in Chile, for example, uh, with the Chilean Plastic Pact, the implementation of a new regulations on EPR. Uh, we have the South African uh, Plastic Pact, also with the new regulations to put in place a new circular economy legislative framework for South Africa. And we also have uh, in New Zealand and Australia, uh, now a, a Plastic Pact also to accelerate the circular economy of plastics with brand owners. When you take a look of the EPR, so for example, on packaging, uh, at the beginning of the century, it was mainly uh, in Europe and, and also partly, partly in, a, in Indonesia and in Japan. And nowadays, uh, we have more and more uh, pressure to put in place uh, EPR across the world. So as you can see uh, in, this, in this image, uh, since three years, we had a lot of projects on the EPR. Uh, and we have uh, now uh, specific resolutions uh, from the 18 nations uh, for the environment program uh, that was uh, published uh, two years ago on the need, uh, thanks to the Nairobi summit, on the need to have uh, new solutions to tackle the plastic pollution, thanks to the EPR uh, scheme. So how does it work, an EPR concretely? Uh, the main idea is to have uh, the, the responsibility uh, that an independent organization has to take care of um, by um, managing their life of the product. So it could be eco-design uh, missions, uh, it could be um, communication or warning raising measure, it could be RG projects, it could be collections, uh, operations regarding the selective collections of uh, the, the waste. So at the end of the day, uh, has the waste as a new resources, uh, to, to be still included within the circular economy. So you have two types of approach for, for the EPR. It could be a non coordinational uh, scheme, which is really, uh, uh, if I could say, operational one. So to have an end on uh, the collections of the waste um, in line with the administrative competencies of the municipalities. 
So it could be hand to hand uh, with public private agreements or within a specific uh, delegations of, uh, of the missions or regarding the collections to be sure that the operators uh, will have an end on the collections, the selective collections of the waste uh, within the EPR and um, to resell the materials, to get revenue from the materials and then to include uh, the new materials as a new resources uh, within the, uh, the circularity of the product. Or it could be a financial one, uh, which is more like, a, if I could say a bank, uh, it's like you are, you are an independent organization that takes the responsibility of the end life uh, of the product, but uh, uniquely uh, on, on the financial part, which means that municipalities has a key role to play uh, linked to the operators uh, for the collections. And then the EPR will support uh, the municipalities and the operators, depending of uh, the selective uh, collections performance. So we have a lot of uh, ways to implement an EPR schemes. This is why um, you have a, a number of concrete examples of what is an EPR across the world, depending of uh, municipalities' competencies, uh, depending also of the regulations, of course, of the commitment of the brand owners. And on the, the key topic that uh, the government would like to address uh, and the products that they would like to address within the circular economy. So it could be poor financial, could be personal uh, organizational uh, with a, a part of uh, operational activities, or it could be a fully uh, organizational uh, with a full uh, operational missions uh, to collect uh, the waste and to have a selective collections process, the sorting process, and then uh, to resell the materials to the recyclers. If we take the example uh, at the French level, so I'm from CTO. So CTO uh, was created uh, 30 years ago. It was uh, eco on a balage before. It was only focused on household packaging. And uh, we had uh, in 2007, another EP organizations for graphic papers, uh, which was Ecofolio. They merged together in 2017. And so since four years, we have uh, a 30 years uh, experience EPO organizations for both uh, graphic papers and household packaging with a general interest mission. And in France, we have made the choice to have a non-profit organizations. So it means that all the brand owners uh, will give uh, the, the responsibility to the EPO uh, as an independent organizations to manage the end life of the packaging and graphic papers just financially. So we have a direct contract uh, with uh, municipalities across the French territory uh, to, to collect uh, the sorting bin and to then have um, direct resale missions uh, to the recyclers. And in fact, we are not the owner of the waste. So it's really the municipalities who get the ownership of the waste and they resell and we support the municipalities depending on the sorting performance. So concretely, what does it mean uh, at the French level? It means that we have uh, 900 contracts uh, with municipalities. And in France, you have uh, 30,000 uh, municipalities. All the consumers together, because we need, of course, to include the consumers uh, for the circular economy by explaining concretely what is a sorting gesture. It's really important, of course. To also explain to the consumer what is the impact of the sorting gesture and what is its role uh, on the circular economy. We also have uh, within the EPR more than 20 patent companies. So it means uh, a big brand owners such as Coke, Pepsi, L'Oreal and Co, but also small and medium uh, enterprises. It's really important to include all the stakeholders of the value chain. And since it's mandatory to contribute uh, to the EPR, we get some few, uh, of course, free riders. So this is why we also need to, to tackle the free riders effect. For example, in Germany, it's a different market. So they have like a, more than 12 EPR schemes only for packaging with, within a competitive market. But they have a regulatory authority to check if there is any free riders and to avoid free riders effects to be sure that at the end of the day, we've got all the brand owners within the EPR schemes to really manage the life of their packaging. And we also linked uh, with the sorting and recycling operators, which are more than a, 500 uh, across the French territory. Um, and we get some uh, contracts as explained to the municipalities regarding uh, the sorting and the recycling process. Um, and we get, uh, we give finance to the municipalities support depending on the uh, collections performance. 
What about the recycling rate? So within the EU, we are trying to, to have the same methodologies. So thanks to the regulations now, we will be able to really compare as the figures between uh, Slovenia, Lithuania, uh, Germany, Spain, Portugal, uh, France on the recycling performance. Uh, because nowadays we have four methodologies, so it's quite insane. It's not possible to compare uh, um, from, from a transparent and a current way uh, all the data. So the idea is that we will be able to compare uh, all the data by the beginning of 2023, uh, thanks to the European Commission that will be able uh, to aggregate all the data with the new methodologies um, based on the 2020 uh, data. If you take a look of, of uh, the French market, we have 70% uh, of recycling rates for all uh, packaging. Within the state accreditation that we have uh, for the mission of the EPR, we need to be uh, able to reach the target of 25% within two years. It's quite a challenging one. And regarding the print and graphic papers, the current recycling rate is uh, uh, 57%, and we need to uh, get uh, plus uh, eight points of percentage, uh, so uh, 65% by 2032, and it's quite also a changing one. When you take a look exactly on the figures, uh, depending on the materials, as you all know, we have a big challenges regarding plastics. What does it mean for plastics? It means that we need to have all the solutions for the plastic packaging. So in fact, we have polymers, uh, depending on the products that are fully recyclable, and we have other ones that are not recyclable at all. So we have a key challenge on the collections. So to be sure that we collect all the plastic packaging, the ones that are fully recyclable and the ones that are not, to be sure we can launch energy projects uh, specifically for PET trays, for example, that are not plastic bottles or uh, PS, such as, for example, PS yogurt pots in, in France, for example, who are a big lovers of uh, milk products. And so we have a lot of uh, HDPE uh, milk bottles, but also PS yogurt pots. And for the PS so-called pots, we don't have available uh, recycling uh, facility scheme. Uh, so we need to uh, put in place a new recycling facility for PS. So we need to find a good solutions. This is why we have launched already projects on PS. Just to give you an idea of uh, what is the concrete contributions of our brand owners uh, to an EPR, um, so the main contributions to an EPR will be for municipalities with a, a, a scheme such as ours uh, for CTO, which is, as I, as I already said, a non-profit activity. We are uh, in a monopolistic situation, so we are the only EPR uh, for household packaging and graphic papers in the French market. And so you can see that more than 70% uh, of the budget will be direct uh, for municipalities. So depending on the sorting performance, what do we have uh, for the other part of the budget? So R&D and eco-design projects. So we really to explain to the consumer, to the brand owners, um, the good eco-design actions and practices, uh, depending of the of the materials and the packaging that they have in the market. So for example, to switch from a multi-layered to a mono-material uh, packaging. Uh, to get a switch from a plastic to another packaging and materials. So we need to have a concrete LCA, so life cycle analysis approach, uh, based on, of course, uh, carbon impact and nowadays biodiversity impact. And it's quite important for me is that now we need to have a link uh, between, of course, uh, the circular economy and uh, the environmental targets. But by saying environmental targets, I mean carbon impact and also biodiversity impact. More and more the biodiversity is really linked to the circular economy, thanks to the save of uh, natural resources, but also to tackle uh, the littering. So within the LCA, what could be interesting is to know what could be uh, the potential of the, um, of the packagings to be littered, but also what could be the environmental benefits uh, from a single use packaging to a multiple use, depending of the area of the scale, uh, depending on the material. Uh, and also to know exactly the environmental impact, so carbon and biodiversity, on the material shift from a, from a packaging to another. We also have for the budget, so quality and operations, which are mainly uh, the audit process. So when you have uh, the materials that is under the sorting uh, process, you need to be sure of the quality. So we have independent audits regarding the quality 
of the materials to be sure that we okay we, we give the finance to the municipalities depending on the sorting performance and then we need to be sure of uh, the quality that will be um, for the materials to be resell to the recyclers and the municipalities will get value from the resale of the materials of course and we also have a, a, a good part of the budget which is for uh, raising awareness uh, campaigns to the consumer so as i mentioned to really explain okay this sorting gesture has a key role to play regarding the circular economy because you save natural resources thanks to the biodiversity impact you save um, co2 impact uh, because these uh, new materials will be uh, for a new uh, product instead of uh, of being uh, for the energy recovery process for example the main focus uh, today uh, to to really uh, to re increase the figures it's on cities and plastics so why cities because we need to densify the collection point so specifically for glass for example in france uh, you mainly so the scheme is not really the same regarding the collections it really depends on the municipalities but mainly it's uh, glass packaging uh, in a specific uh, sorting bin all the other um, packaging and the graphic paper in the same bin sometimes it's different it could be glass packaging in a bin uh, fiber-based packaging in another one and non-fiber-based in a third one. And then, of course, residual waste bin. Nowadays, we need to really accelerate uh, the figures and the collections rate on, uh, on glass. So we need, this is why we need to densify collection points. We need to communicate to citizens and, of course, from the youngest to the oldest one to really explain uh, the key process of the circular economy, the key roles they have to play and also to innovate uh, with our clients uh, as the uh, innovations of uh, the sorting and the collection process uh, to get incentives for brand owners, for example, to use uh, the nudge uh, as, a, as a key role to play from the cognitive process to explain to the consumer uh, the good gesture and so on. So for example, in Paris, uh, is the first big uh, image that you can see in the left side, uh, we have a, a, a collection bin which is directly on the street. This could be difficult to have a, a sorting bin within the building. It's a really a densified area in Paris. Um, so to, to be simple for the consumer to sort, we have put in place a, such a bin outside of, of the home. So out of home, directly on the streets, to be sure that when they will go to work, when they go to, to the shops, they will put the packaging and the papers and sometimes the textile, so linked with uh, the EPR for, for the textile products to make the good gesture. Also in the natural area, so to take all the littering. Uh, furthermore, we need to increase uh, the collections for the on-the-go consumptions because nowadays we are not enough. Um, it's not perfect, of course, so we need to accelerate this. We have not enough uh, sorting bins on the streets, but if you want to, to be to the consumers to be able to sort all the day long and all the times need to be sure that they will make the same gesture at home and out of home. So you need to put in place, of course, a selective collection bin uh, for the on-the-go um, area, such as uh, train stations, airports, um, stadiums, and so on. And also, uh, we, we put a lot of pressure to the municipalities, to the government, to put in place the pay as policy. It's really important. The pay as policy is when you you pay uh, to the municipalities depending of uh, the sorting uh, gesture, depending of the waste that you put in the sorting bin. So more waste that you put uh, in the sorting bin, less you put in the residual bin. Of course, when you make a good gesture, and less you will have to pay uh, the, the municipalities. So less uh, waste you have in the residual bin, less, uh, less um, budget you will have to pay to the municipalities. Regarding plastic, and I will uh, finish on that, we need to double the recycling rate for plastics, of course. So as you, can, as you saw just before, uh, the figures are 29% uh, of the plastic packaging uh, as a recycling rate. It's not enough. We need to reach a target of 50% by 2025 at the European stage and 55% by 2030. So we really need to accelerate the circularity of plastics what does it mean uh, in concrete actions uh, as an EPR organization? It means to collect all the plastic packaging by extending the sorting instructions uh, for all plastic packaging, so by the end of 2022, to create a positive drive effect for all materials by explaining to the consumer to sort everything, uh, 
and by modernizing sorting sectors um, to, to be sure that we are all the plastic waste that will be, uh, plastic packaging waste that will be um, really sought within the sorting gesture. So to really split into different categories, depending on the product, depending on the polymers. So the debates on plastic, as you know, we have uh, uh, four challenges, which is the low recycling rate, the pressure from the regulatory and authority side, the high, high contributions to the carbon impact in some sectors, and also, uh, of course, the biodiversity impact if some packaging are littered. And the health concerns, specifically on microplastics, this is why the European Commission would like to tackle the international and non-international um, microplastics that are in the products framework. So we have made the choice here in France to, um, to ask to the consumers to sort all the plastic packaging within the same bin. So before it was only focused on uh, so some bottles, flacons and bottles. Now we have to put uh, in the sorting bin plastic bags, uh, cosmetic products, so specifically plastic uh, cosmetic product, of course, yogurt pot, flexibles and wrappers. Uh, why? Because we would like to get a spillover effect for all packagings to be sure that uh, the citizens will not ask every time the questions, okay, do I need to put this plastic packaging into the sorting bin or not? Then to uh, launch RG projects, so specifically for uh, polymers and motors, whether well, that we don't have any uh, recycling uh, scheme. And at the, at the end of the day, to get 100% solutions for all uh, plastic packaging. I'm not going into much details on this because we could talk about it three hours, but just to give you an idea from the operational point of view that now EPR put in place eco-modulations. What does it mean? It means that we ask two brand owners uh, within a bonus and malus system, like incentives. So they, they have the obligations to pay for the management of the end life of their product and specifically for packaging here. Uh, and we, had, we, we put in place eco-modulations of the fee to the EPR. So for example, to increase the recycled content, um, if there are any disruptors on the recycling facility uh, into the packaging for the eco-design stage, then we have to pay a malus. So really the idea is to really accelerate the circular economy of, of uh, packaging. And now that we are uh, in France with a new law, a new circular economy that was published last year, we need, for example, for CTO uh, to reach targets on reusable packaging, which are uh, 5% by 2023 and 10% by 2027. It's quite huge. Uh, so for example, uh, maybe the commodulations could be a tool uh, an incentive uh, to switch from a single use to a multiple use, but it really depends on the life cycle analysis and uh, the scale of such uh, such uh, such innovation. Or the commodulations could be also a tool to accelerate the recycled content. Or it could be also a tool to really uh, help brand owners to make a good choice based on the good environmental impact. And thanks to this, all these new uh, actions. Uh, with the extension of the sorting instructions that now we have 50% of the populations under the new uh, same instructions. Uh, we hope to have at the end of 2022, beginning of 2023, all, uh, all the territory uh, within the new sorting instructions. Why it, take, uh, it takes so much time? Because we need to ask to all municipalities to explain to the citizens and to have a good process regarding the collections of all. Um, plastic packaging. And once again, we have in France 36,000 municipalities with 900 contracts for the APR scheme. And we need also um, to modernize the sorting centers to be sure that the sorting centers will be able to uh, get the process and the sorting process of uh, the plastic packaging. And now with all these new deposits of uh, plastic packaging that are not fully recyclable, we try to find new solutions, such as for PET trays that are not plastic bottles, and for uh, PS, such as PS or coke pots. Last but not least, just to give you the figures I have mentioned, big challenge on uh, plastic packaging, of course. Uh, we have big targets uh, at the EU level uh, nowadays, so it's uh, more than 20% uh, within the internal market. We need to, to go forward uh, by uh, achieving a target of 50% by 2025, 55% by 2030, and even France would like to have all plastic recycled by 2025, so it's quite a challenging one. 
And nowadays, we have a big pressure from the regulatory uh, side. Uh, it's not a low, uh, a low course here, but just to give you an idea that uh, the, the European Commission, uh, with the Green Deal and with the new Circular Economy Action Plan uh, that was published just one year ago, it was the 9th of March last year, we have like new ambitions uh, from the European Commission and from the EU to really accelerate the circular economy, not only on packaging, of course, also on textiles and the building sectors, uh, on, on the plastics and so on, and the electronic products. And we have now a challenging also law in France that is the most uh, challenging one. And we hope that we have a, an adequation and a current policies between France and EU regarding all these policies, specifically on plastics, specifically on the right to repair, uh, specifically on EPR, uh, to take inspiration of all the national policies and member states to really have a, a current approach on circular economy and to promote this approach at the international scale. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Axel, for making such a splendid, insightful, and elaborated presentation. And we have got some interesting questions for you in chat box. So uh, can we go ahead with questions? Or uh, uh, I mean, there are some participants who themselves would love to ask their questions. Yes, now is the time. So Vesna, um, you had a question before. Uh, please ask it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Axel, for this great presentation. I have three questions. <laughs> um, so the first one, now these packaging materials, for example, there are many different varieties and there are more and more materials coming to the market, right? Like we have like from this uh, conventional plastic, but now also this different types of bioplastic, like compostable bioplastic that you can, you know, just compost it and the bioplastic that is not biodegradable. And then we have also the materials from the recycled, so from the secondary plastic material, recycled plastics. So I was thinking like, is it possible, you know, to encourage the producers to use the more sustainable materials, let's say compostable plastic that you can really just compost uh, through the EPR. So could it be like, for example, differentiate the fees that producers pay depending on the materials that they use. And by this, like discouraging the use of conventional plastics and encouraging the use of really sustainable materials. And I don't mean this bioplastic that, you know, it's basically same as conventional plastic. Uh, because I, I see one important uh, problem here, like we talk about recycling as like a circular economy, but you know it's not because a recycling economy is recycling economy. You cannot recycle on and on and on and on. Sooner or later, like you recycle three times, then you have to put it into waste. So this is why like with new innovation, new materials, we would like, you know, make material circulating. So I'm, I, I'm thinking like this for a long time to make this kind of scheme, how EPR could uh, discourage and encourage uh, use of different types of materials from the producers. So this is one of my questions. Another question is how to make sure that producers join the, this PRO, the producers, the, the producers uh, organization, the responsibilities organization, and uh, to apply with the EPR. And the third uh, question, if you maybe know, uh, like in developing countries, they also have the informal sector. So like a waste pickers, they, they are not, uh, they are not associations, so they are just there by themselves. So how, do you have any advice how to establish the EPR in this kind of countries where they also have the informal sector? Thank you. Yeah, with pleasure. It's, it's really interesting questions. Um, we, we could debate uh, three hours on this. Uh, to come back to the first one, uh, I would say, of course, the co-modulations of the fee are quite a good incentive uh, to go forward the reductions 
of the use of materials to go for a more sustainable uh, material. But we need to be sure of the environmental impact of uh, bio-based and biodegradable plastics. And according to, to my company, and according also to the European Commission, maybe you can take a look. Uh, you have a, a joint research uh, centers uh, conclusions from the European Commission on, on biodegradable uh, plastic. It really depends on the product. Sometimes it could make sense for small packaging, but some, for all the types of packaging, it doesn't make sense. Because depending of, um, of the impact, um, because of the sorting gesture, so sometimes it's not really um, fully comprehensive for the consumers regarding the biodegradability of the bio-based or of the packaging. Sometimes you don't have the, the bio collection scheme. So for example, in France, uh, we are really la late regarding the organic collections, organic waste collections. For example, in Italy, they are quite in advance. So we need also to be sure of the currency of, of the collection scheme. Uh, I would say also uh, regarding the, the, the marking requirements. So is it like uh, home compostable? Is it industrial compostable? Do we have all the infrastructures regarding uh, the compostability specifically for the industrial uh, compostability? And I would say to, to go further, really the commissions could be a tool for the reductions. I'm fully aligned with you regarding uh, the end life of the recycling. Recycling is not a solution. It could be a part of the solution, but it's not the final one. So we need to take the advantage of the eco-modulations to concretely reduce the use of materials. And thanks to the, to the current uh, approach on the life cycle analysis, this is why I was mentioning the carbon impact, but also the biodiversity impact. Does it make sense uh, from the biodiversity uh, point of view to have bio-based or biological product. I'm not, I'm not even sure. I, I don't know, I'm not a scientist and I'm not even sure of this, of this, even as a consumer. And this is why the European Commission is currently working on minimum requirements on EPR and on the eco-modulations. And we are supposed to have a, a new guidance on this and to really give a clear view at the European level to have the same current principle on eco-modulations across Europe. Uh, regarding EPR and how to put in place eco-modulations. And it makes a link with your second questions. So uh, with these uh, guidelines, we will also be able uh, to, to really uh, share good practices about uh, the contributions to the EPR. For example, in France, so it's mandatory to contribute to the EPR. And if you are a free rider, it will be the administrations that will give you a fine if you didn't contribute to the EPR. In Germany, you have a regulatory authorities that manage the contributions of uh, the EPR schemes and that will give you also fines if you don't contribute to one of the 12 EPR organizations for packaging. So in my point of view, it needs to be, uh, of course, monetary and then to have a regulatory power, but that not has to be in the hands of the EPR. It's really the administrations that needs to, to get the power of, of the fine and not the EPR. We don't have any regulatory power and, and thanks to the organizations because it's a private organizations. And for the third questions, uh, sorry, I didn't remember. About the informal sector waste. Ah, yes, yes, about the informal sector. Yeah, of course. Um, so I have to work uh, with, uh, for example, uh, the Vietnamese uh, Ministry of Environment or uh, with, with South Africa recently. Uh, it's not it's not the same at all. We we couldn't say okay as an accidental point of view. Uh, let's do like Europe uh, by implementing an EPR uh, without any uh, the same uh, scheme of uh, organizations of the economy. So I think of course when you put in place an EPR, you need of course to uh, include the informal economy. This is why when you take the example of Petco, which is the EPR for for PET uh, for PET uh, bottles in uh, in South Africa. Uh, from the beginning, they have included the waste pickers and the informal economy within the system to be sure that there is a currency between uh, the recyclers, the operators, and of course uh, the waste pickers and the informal economy, and to be sure that we we are all well, that we want the loop. Okay, uh, excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. Maybe I would uh, like to contact you <laughs> uh, for something additional. Yeah, yeah, it was a pleasure. Uh, um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Vesna. Thank you. And Axel, we got three more questions for you, if you could quickly answer them. So the uh, first question is, is EPR a French invention? Who set the accreditation process? Who is issuing the accreditation? 
Yeah, really quickly, uh, the EPI is the applications of the polluter price principle, which is in economy uh, the PIGU principle, huh? uh, which was uh, uh, the EPI was uh, one of the main uh, approach of the polluter price principle was what was which was sorry recognized at the beginning of 70s by the OECD, and the first EPI organizations was in Germany, in fact, uh, in 1991. And the second one was in France in 1992 with uh, Ecoemblage, so uh, the previous uh, CTO. Who sets the accreditation process? It's the public administrations in France. Uh, so it's a public uh, agreement for five years, and we need to ask uh, to renew the accreditations. And uh, before we didn't get any fine if we didn't uh, reach a target, and now with the new law, thanks to the new law, really, huh? now we get some fines if we don't reach a target that we have under the state accreditations. And uh, our EPR are connected by an information system, of course. Uh, so I'm not sure it will be answered completely to the, to the questions, but we have a system with municipalities as a reporting uh, regarding the collection rate and after with recyclers operators to be sure that we have the traceability of the materials. And we have also a, a, a process uh, with brand owners to know exactly the level of contributions depending of the consumer sale unit within the market. So we could make a balance between the contributions and then uh, the finance that we give to municipalities. And we, we share the data to the environmental agency at the French level. And then the environmental agency will share the data to the European Commission, of course, to get uh, aggregate uh, data. Okay, Axel, there is one more question. If you could answer that also quickly. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, uh, how do you start putting together an EPI and, and who are the key stakeholders? Uh, how do you start putting together an EPI? It could be a, a voluntary commitment. For example, at the beginning in Vietnam, it was a voluntary commitment, such as uh, in France, at, at the really beginning, it was a voluntary commitment from industries, uh, specifically with Danone. Uh, and then the regulatory uh, side uh, uh, appeared, appeared to have a common accreditations. So it could be uh, within the regulations. So if you take a look for the French example, but also for Vietnam, it was uh, accreditations. And then uh, the ministry said, okay, let's put a regulatory framework. And as I explained to, uh, to the Vietnamese government, from my point of view, it's better to include all the packagings together when you start an EPR, Otherwise, it would be a mess to include all the materials because you have like competitivity between materials, of course. Uh, you don't have the same level of, uh, of the price of the materials. When you get a shift from a materials to another one, it will be a mess. So to be sure to include all the sectors and all the materials and also to be sure of the, of the scope of your cost. Is it only uh, for the end life of the packaging or is it only also for littering? And for example, the European commissions with a single use plastic directive ask to the EPR to now cover the cost of the littering. So by including this cost, we need also to be sure of uh, the coordinations with municipalities and to be sure of the coordinations for the contributions to get real incentives for brand owners. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, I mean, finally, I mean, just one more question. If EPR is connected with information technology, information system, I'm sorry. But he uh, replied that. I'm happy. Okay, Thank okay. You. I'm sorry if you have covered yes. it. Thanks so a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Excel. Thanks Thank to you. you for being with us. And if possible, you stay with us till the end of the program. We would appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, that is. Thanks a lot. So let's move on to our next segment of uh, the program. As they say that in nature, there is no such thing as waste. In nature, nothing is wasted everything is recycled. So our next speaker who is joining us from India also has the same belief and some intriguing stories to share with us. Stories of innovation and creativity, stories of creating something really useful for underprivileged. She's a designer turned social entrepreneur who is known across India for Ammo Matri and Chikutti dolls. Shaya Bedros, her recent initiative made of tailoring scrap of PP has attracted world attention with World Economic Forum Davos agenda. And her other initiative that includes plantable paper pen with seed as an alternative to plastic disposable pen is being replicated and copied worldwide. 
she owns its global patent as well she is a governing council member of national innovation council india we welcome you lakshmi manan and over to you lakshmi unmute yourself unmute yourself lakshmi unmute sorry sorry yeah. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Rajni, and uh, thank you for having me here. Um, so um, I uh, have an organization, run an organization called Pure Living, P-U-R-E, which stands for Products Upcycled, Recycled, and Economized. It's an acronym uh, of uh, the Products Upcycled, Recycled, and Economized. And recently, we have started doing projects for the urban, rural, and egalitarian everything that it is uh, in a very sustainable model and also in the mode of circular economy. Like uh, she rightly said, I always feel that there is nothing called waste, you know, just because the human intellect hasn't come up with the, doesn't have the versatility to find utility for the uh, things that we categorize as waste, we shamelessly call, you know, like it is trash. Uh, so I'd been trying to add more value to the so-called waste and give it a new life. And so extending the life and, uh, uh, you know, just uh, do justice to the raw materials that has gone into making uh, those products. So to begin with, one of the products that I do is, uh, I'll just walk you through a couple of initiatives. Um, so this is that paper pen that uh, she was talking about. So this is, there's a, a refill inside and it is made by um, the, uh, the waste paper that I collect from the printing press or the examination paper or from the stationery from uh, corporates. And um, it is round around a refill. And I also added a seed because there's a tiny little space over there and I'm an interior designer as well by profession. So I was worried about the optimization of the space. So when I found that there was a tiny little space over there, I was wondering what, I, what can I uh, do there to add more value to the pen. So that is how I make, uh, came up with uh, putting a seed over there. So if you throw it away, it will grow into a tree. Uh, so every pen, uh, it has a paper cap uh, and a write-up saying that, you know, the need uh, for such a pen because the value of a tree is almost 36 lakh rupees. If you actually put value on the oxygen that it gives, uh, uh, the soil erosion, it prevents the microorganisms that it uh, helps uh, in sustaining and so many other things. So uh, the simple fact that, you know, nature doesn't need people, it's the people who need nature that brought me to kind of, you know, invent something like this. Um, because I always say that, you know, man has traveled through ice age, stone age, metal age to final, finally reach garbage. So we are in the garb age now. And if you don't take a deliberate effort to, you know, correct yourself, you will soon be in uh, damage. So that is one of the uh, reasons why I kind of came up with this pen. And um, another project, and so this is a uh, project is supporting uh, pre, uh, people who are paraplegics, a lot of women, because there is a very little uh, skill that is needed to make this. So the, pro the process is um, split into such a way that, you know, people of all skill sets can be part of it. Even my grandma, who is 95, she helps us with putting the cap on the pen. So we are uh, employing or engaging people uh, from all sections of the society. So the, uh, the, the paper that is being made by cutting down the trees, uh, so once, you, once a paper is thrown away, it is done forever, right? So that is the paper that we use. So a regular paper like this, which is cut it in size and wrapped around a refill and that becomes, so it is, we are repurposing uh, that uh, uh, paper. So uh, that is a pen project. And the next one that we have come up with is called Che Kuti Dolls. These are like tiny little, cute little dolls. Um, the incident that uh, led to the birth of this doll is um, in 2018, there was a severe um, flood that has hit our state in India in, uh, called Kerala. So around uh, eight days, uh, eight feet of water was logged up in an entire village, which was very known for the handloom industry. So every single piece was kind of submerged under the water and water just, and the water and the filth and the dirt, everything was flowing through it, making it, you know, not, they were not able to salvage it when the water finally receded. 
So they tried to chlorinate it, they tried to wash it, but it was all in vain because it was like pure white uh, um, cloth like this and uh, it was it, it cannot be used at all. So the only option that they had was to burn down the entire fabric. So that is when somebody called me saying that they knew that I have this liking for the for what uh, people normally categorize as waste. So they called up and asked me whether I can do something about it. So I'm a fashion designer as well. So I thought, you know, uh, and I know I worked very closely with handloom weavers. So I know uh, that, you know, uh, the kind of effort that goes into weaving every inch of fabric. So I thought if I cannot save that clothes, my um, designer status itself is at stake. So it, it became my moral responsibility to somehow save those clothes. So what I did was I collected the cloth, I washed it again. I could see that it was still have the stains and scars on it. But that was kind of a reflection of the people during those days. You know, wherever we travel, it was all filthy with stains and dirt on the wall and every heart had a scar. So I thought, why don't I convert that cloth into these tiny little dolls that represented each of us in this state? So this became a mascot of resilience, uh, a beacon of hope and um, a, a, a damage which was like 2 million for the handloom weavers in fourth four months, we generated 3.4 million just by selling these dolls. And this was made by people in nine countries, around 50,000 volunteers. So we were training them. They would take the material from us. They would make these dolls and people would buy it. So in a UN Reconstruction Conference, I think World Bank was actually di um, distributing these to the delegates who had come for the conference. So this, this had literally become a, a beacon of hope, sort of. So this is another example of the circular economy. Like, you know, we are trying to like, it's all, it's all about refurbishing, repairing, sharing, and extending the life of something that is already made, right? So this is another example of uh, what we did through the uh, circular economy. And the third one is um, the, the mattress, which I just made uh, in August during the uh, COVID days. Uh, when the COVID uh, cases started spiking in our state, the government ordered the local uh, governing body to set up um, first line treatment centers, the COVID care centers in every uh, district sort of. So there was a demand of around 50,000 mattresses during those days. Due to the lockdown and other uh, restrictions, we were not able to bring in the mattresses from other states who are the main producers of it. So I thought, you know, there was, um, I was observing the different uh, facets that has brought in during the uh, problems that has brought in during the COVID. One was um, uh, job uh, loss. Another one was a huge pile of, you know, PP, the, 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 the PP material that was being uh, kind of uh, being accumulated in every factory, every place, because most of them didn't know what to do with this material since it has plastic lining. It was quite a raw, new raw material for many of the tailoring units that start, suddenly started making the mask and the gowns for the uh, first line uh, workers. So it was all being accumulated. So I thought, why don't I? So there was a need for the mattress. There was a severe um, uh, job loss and there was a huge accumulation of PPE material waste that was being accumulated. So just by touching these three dots, I thought, you know, uh, why don't I convert those PP scraps into mattresses? So I started collecting those. And so it comes in like, you know, the fresh ones. These are from the factory. So these are like the, uh, uh, the untouched ones. So when you cut the neck and the sleeve and all that, these are the off cuts that comes from the factory. These are not the used ones. So we use that scrap and we just braid it into rope like this. And by tying it together, this is a smaller version that I'm showing. By tying it together, we made it into mattresses. So there is no need for a needle or a machine or a thread to make one. If you know how to braid your hair, you can pretty much make, make a mattress. So I engaged around 30 people in my neighborhood, 30 ladies who lost their jobs and gave them like in, in a one, one hour's time, they were able to kind of, you know, get the nitty gritties of how to make it. So uh, they were making it and in, uh, we have used up almost 9,000 kilos of uh, these uh, uh, offcuts in four months. 
and this is being donated to the uh, covid care centers uh, because government had given an instruction to the local uh, governing bodies that once a patient leaves you have to burn that mattresses so that you know the uh, uh, covid is not spread uh, so this one since it has a plastic coating in it you could actually literally soak it in uh, soap water and it will be 100% sanitized so you can actually reuse it and this this is also we are also now being we are distributing it to the tribal community the homeless people so this is a model so the multiple uh, impact that it has brought in is that it has given job for many people who lost their job it is upcycling the ppe the off cuts and also providing a very important commodity at a very very low cost you know only the labor charge is what we had to give because the raw material almost came for free so we had been extensively now giving it to uh, homeless people tribal community and anybody who would need a mattress because i feel that a good night sleep is a basic right of every human being and now we are giving online training to people in different areas and we have a website where we have given the demo videos of this so that anybody in the world can copy it they can replicate it and scale it up so uh, in, if, if instead of this pp scrap you can also use the tailoring waste the tailoring scrap from the uh, tailoring shops as well in case if there is difficulty in finding the ppe material so uh, any any used material can be actually converted into i mean fabric can be converted into making this um, so this is what made it to the davos agenda in the world economic forum this year so through that many countries have approached us and we had been giving you know instructions and uh, guidance to make it so those are these are one like the three uh, most popular uh, projects that had been doing in the mode of circular economy uh, using the things that normally people categorize as waste so i i've just called a coined a word called tuf t u f which means still a utility is found you know you cannot just call something waste just because you have you have not come up with an idea for that come up with an utility for that so let's let's not call something waste let us call it tuf it is tough to find a utility but it ultimately somebody will come up with a a good use of that so that's it amazing amazing presentation lakshmi uh, and seriously i mean it's really impressive the way you have come up with these new ideas and you know i, I think everything your all innovation your creativity your work for the society is applaudable so thank, thank you so you. much and uh, we have few questions for you but the first question uh, i have for you Excellent. and uh, because i know indian domestic market so i want to understand from you what hurdles what challenges did you face while promoting these products in domestic market also did you try promoting these products in international market as well uh yes actually when it comes to the pen that was a quite a big, that was like 6 uh, years back it was completely a new product uh, nobody had seen it nobody has used it so when we say paper pen they were completely confused about you know the sturdiness of it you know um, how strong it is can we actually hold it will it bend off you know things like that uh, so until uh, they had one on the one in their hand they were kind of very uh, i mean you know unsure about it um and there were like so many other questions i think they got so used to using that plastic so they were very keen in finding a fault also for since we are uh, presenting a introducing a new product right so uh, it, initially it was a bit tough but i think people gradually understood the importance of you know the sustainability and the need for um, changing our habits to using more of such products for our own good um so it was not a very easy journey in the beginning but now we have like very big corporates who have become our csr partners and they had been using this just these pens in every of office of theirs because when it comes to the carbon auditing it's almost zero uh, in that factor in that uh, aspect so we had been getting very good support now internationally i think many are making because uh, th there are so many videos and i've been seeing it in amazon and other places where people are making it so i am so glad that you know it is spreading wide and uh, it's uh, actually bringing more uh, giving a livelihood to many people who are in wheelchair who are paraplegics because if they can move their fingers they can pretty much make these pens 
and you will always have demand for pens especially in a country like india with so many people uh, is a good market so i have not actually ventured to give it out uh, in, in the international market i am happy with the customers in india itself thank you so much lakshmi and we would request all participants if they have any question for lakshmi menon please do ask and uh, because she has wonderful innovative innovative products and she have showed the raw, raw material also so i think i have uh, a question ranji uh, a very impressive stories all of them i mean i i watched your video on the third uh, part on the mattresses a couple of uh, months ago and it was really inspiring it's also a very good video um, I wanted to ask how difficult or how easy it is to scale uh, projects like that. So scalability of projects and also, but uh, on a, another uh, completely uh, different point, um, how much opportunities now do you have to inspire other young entrepreneurs and startups uh, to see that small projects can matter and small projects can get big, um, even like a little seed in, in a pen, you know? But uh, you are just a really good example how um, small stories can really make a big difference. So on one hand, how, can, how, how do you find a way to inspire others, to show that they, everybody can contribute to circular economy and change the world? And on the other hand, uh, how do you manage scalability? I think um, the crisis makes the unthinkable inevitable, right? We have to come up with some kind of a solution when we are hit like hit with you know situations like this. Even while making that pen, we are already very late. We are already on the verge of you know a, a big uh, danger. So such initiatives had to be, such products have to be invented. And I think the response was very good because. People had been looking for avenues through which they could also switch over to a greener living. They didn't know how. So when you give them a product or a platform to do that, they would immediately, you know, kind of follow the uh, uh, path and uh, uh, they joined the, 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 the entire the movement. So uh, scalability is so easy because the process has been clearly given in so many demo videos. And this is not rocket science. It is just, you know, putting a... Uh, a, a refill there and just rolling it, you know. Um, so basically like, what you're saying is that your promotion helped you to scale. So it was a good uh, video promotion and social, uh, uh, yeah. social yeah, media I mean, promotion. Like, yeah, I mean, media has been so supportive, like everybody, all these initiatives, I think the initial kick, the kick starting was done by media. They could get the crux of it. They, they understood the importance of something like this at that particular hour, you know, uh, uh, that, that time. So they had been taking it far and wide. So I think the uniqueness of the idea, uh, if there is a, you know, it's a very powerful, unique idea, then the rest happens on its own, actually. Um, I think you know, in two, three months for, for the Shaya, for the mattress project to reach World Economic Forum, I think it's purely because of the timing and the kind of raw materials and the style in which we kind of conducted that entire uh, project. Because it was touching upon a lot of uh, um, pressing uh, needs of that society at that time, even, even now. So uh, I, I was very fortunate to have like, you know, uh, me, the kind of support that they had been getting from media and, uh, and business magnets like um, Mahindra, is one of the leading industrialists in India. And he tweeted saying that, you know, we need such kind of inventions along with the inventions of spacecraft and that he's ready to invest in this if I wish to uh, take it forward. So that's the kind of support that we've been getting in every project. Because everything is so simple. I mean, the, you don't have to actually think twice to understand that or even buy that, right? So it's so clear, transparent with lots of clarity and you know where to use it and how to use it and the need. So it kind of, uh, you know, sells uh, on its own. Okay. So is there any other question, Pina, for Lakshmi? Um, uh, no, I haven't seen any anything else okay, in the okay. comments. So I don't think so. Okay, okay. But Lakshmi, we would request you to stay with us till the end of the program. Uh, because in the end also we take up some questions and okay. uh, so we would certainly appreciate it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. 
So it's time to welcome our third speaker from Romania, Dr. Alina Simina Lekatos. Dr. Alina Simina is co-founding member and president of the Institute for Circular Economy and Environment, Ernest Lupin, since 2012. Simina's background is material science and has a bachelor in economy, has PhD degree in engineering and management in 2011. Uh, her main research topics include circular economy with focus on social circular economy, circular development strategies, circular cities, life cycle assessment, cradle to cradle, industrial symbiosis, and environmental certification. So the floor is all yours, Dr. Alina. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to start to uh, say uh, uh, hello to everyone and uh, to be glad that uh, our people interested in circular economy in uh, India and in other countries too. And uh, I want to salute uh, Alex uh, Daru too, because we know each other from two or three years. Uh, yes, the time is passed. Um, related to uh, my presentation about uh, our institute, I will say that uh, we start in uh, 2012, like an uh, NGO uh, based in Transylvania on Northwest of Romania uh, from uh, an initiative of young people from Technical University of Cluj-Napoca with the purpose uh, to mobilize uh, individual to circular economy. Uh, how? Uh, we try to uh, contribute it to the all uh, 17 sustainable development goals from our activities uh, like uh, cities and mobilities, food and light, uh, land system and uh, energy system uh, are our focus that uh, in which we are developing our projects. Uh, most of the projects are related to the uh, cities and regions. I used to contribute to the development on uh, resi uh, resilient local circular uh, economy in uh, this area. We develop uh, some pilot projects right now in uh, biggest and small town towns. And uh, the other direction, it is in uh, food and uh, land uh, uh, use in order to contribute to the uh, reduction of the food uh, waste uh, and to contribute to the uh, decarbonization of this process. These are some uh, of our pro uh, projects. The others are related to the product and services. Uh, we are focused on uh, redesign or in uh, uh, flow analysis in different uh, small and medium uh, companies. But we, let's say from the last years, we start to work with governments in order to contribute to, uh, uh, to measure the circular economy in uh, our uh, municipalities and in our companies and uh, to come with some mindset uh, in order to change the behavior because uh, we were we was until now habituated to a linear economy uh, based in co consumerism uh, and we want to change that to uh, develop a behavior based in circularism not in consumerism this is one of the other focus of uh, of us and not least, the energy system, we try to uh, find solution into what means green energies. Why? Because uh, after an analysis uh, made from European Commission uh, f uh, and some other um, research uh, organization, uh, how uh, you see, if we continue it in the, the same way, like today to produce and consume, uh, after 2015, we will not have any more uh, resources. 
and this will be a very huge problem. Uh, starting from here, we, con we try to contribute to the uh, European action plan from circular economy because we was, uh, was part of the European uh, stakeholder platform on circular economy. And uh, our attribution in this platform, it was to facilitate the transition to circular economy in our country, in Romania, and to find and help to uh, business models uh, in circular economy project or other actions uh, that have the uh, circular economy like a purpose. Uh, why? Because we want to, uh, minimize the uh, waste generation uh, to uh, develop um, material flow in what means uh, more uh, resilient and uh, efficiency uh, uh, consume of the resources and, and bring the economic and social and environmental uh, goals in order to uh, accomplish our mission. How? Uh, we are, uh, let's say, uh, use the Ellen McCartan butterfly, where we added the 17 sustainable development goals in order to, uh, to create uh, our focus uh, around the people, because the, the human uh, people, it is in the middle, and around uh, of him is the uh, biosphere and technosphere, uh, in order to uh, develop projects in this way, uh, having in mind the uh, reuse, reduce, uh, re cycle and uh, share and so on. That means the technical sphere and uh, producing uh, bios, uh, biogas, uh, biochemical uh, processes or regeneration in order to create a more sustainable uh, environment for, for us. Um, which are the benefits that we uh, saw in this process and in our analysis because we do a lot of research in this direction in our country uh, to identify what are uh, the uh, which are the the barriers and uh, uh, how uh, we find the opportunities in, in this direction and um, what we discovered <clears throat> was related uh, to the fact that the education are not appropriated, is not prepared for, uh, for this direction. And we don't have uh, a focus in what means uh, this strategy on circular economy. And for, for this reason, we must come with um, uh, basic concept like eco design, life cycle uh, assessment, uh, raw materials, uh, durability, uh, recyclability, and so on, in order to uh, develop our our behavior. Uh, regulation in our processes are not so focuses in low resource consumption or energy consumption, cleanliness technology or uh, lean technology. And uh, let's say the most important, uh, but not the least, the innovation. Uh, our uh, system, uh, at least in Romania, uh, is not so developing in uh, innovation in this way. And this is other problem that we uh, discovered. And with uh, this missing of uh, industrial symbiosis or sharing economy or waste management or other uh, regulation re uh, regarded to the free airs, uh, it is a problem. But behind of this, we discover which are the benefit. Uh, because if we are doing this, we have only uh, uh, 
only uh, doing only good result, only a benefit for our uh, environment, but not only for the society too and for economical too, because we can create a new job in uh, in order to uh, create uh, new activities and to discover new uh, resources uh, that can uh, substitute, uh, substitute the old uh, materials that you uh, we use it in this uh, direction. Uh, what we uh, do, we try to develop our uh, strategy on circular economy in Romania. Uh, when the Romania has the presidency, presidency to the European Commission. Uh, right now, we work on the action plan on circular economy from the uh, central region of Romania. We was involved in Interreg projects, in uh, Horizon uh, project, and in uh, local projects. Uh, how I said, we try to develop uh, and uh, engage uh, one biggest municipality from Romania to become a circular town and uh, a small town because we want to have two uh, pilots, uh, pilot action, one for a uh, biggest municipality and uh, one to uh, a lowest mun municipality. And we right now we try to implement this strategy starting with 2021 and we'll see until 2030 uh, uh, if they will be enabled to uh, develop this uh, and to say that uh, their town are completely circular and to accomplish their strategy. Uh, we have uh, and implement different projects in what means uh, green branding, uh, circular uh, social enterprises because we believe that the social enterprises is the core of the circular economy because right now uh, doing circular economy for companies is not so easy in uh, need a lot of investment and uh, but the social economy can uh, come with uh, help in this direction in order to uh, develop uh, a um, connection with this uh, different problem that the uh, businesses are uh, identifying. We work on with a lot of students uh, and youth in generally in our projects in order to uh, develop this concept of circular economy. Uh, and uh, or on sustainable produ production and consumption. Uh, most of them are in Erasmus Plus uh, project, but in uh, Era uh, Europe for citizens too. And uh, these are the direction for, it, this was the direction for our, uh, some researches, books, that we are uh, writing in what means uh, circular economy. Here we try to present our results in uh, uh, different activities that we have at to the European Commission where we was part of the European stakeholder platform to the United Nations where we present our results from uh, all the Europe on what means uh, circular economy and we, what is the level of implementing uh, this uh, kind of activities. And we, uh, uh, in our country too, we present what uh, are the uh, result in circular economy. Here are some um, activities on uh, social, so social economy, circular social economy, we try to develop uh, different activities in plastic uh, uh, waste to reduce the plastic in order to reduce the textile Im impact, to reduce the uh, food waste. We develop uh, and we are part of the food waste bank. And right now we have a federation of food waste bank in Romania in order to reduce the impact of the 
uh, food waste in our country. Um, we try to uh, to focus uh, right now in uh, these two aspects because the food uh, and the, the textiles are the most, uh, let's say, uh, with the highest impact of pollution in uh, uh, Europe, but, uh, but in our country too. Uh, these are uh, some activities in uh, uh, recycling uh, uh, electronics and, and electrocosmics, uh, plastics, wood, and uh, other materials that we uh, tried to use it in different uh, projects that we have it. Uh, of course, in collaboration with uh, different companies uh, where we uh, have the possibility to implement our, uh, let's say, principles in what means uh, circular economy in Romania. Thank you uh, so much that it was my uh, presentation. Uh, if are questions, uh, I'm yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Elena. We really appreciate your presentation and the effort you have put in to make uh, such an in, uh, such an incredibly informative and interesting presentation. So I have a question for you. Uh, since uh, you have showed one slide where you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, circular economy and recycling, generating new employment and new employment opportunities. So how much role of circular economy do you see from the perspective of generating employment in Romania? Right now, uh, we, we try to prepare us for the next uh, financial exercise uh, that are coming from the European Com uh, Commission from 2021-2027. It is a new plan from the uh, resilience from the European Commission. And we try to develop uh, some direction from the, uh, from the environment minister in order to uh, create a legislation because right now we have a legislation in what means uh, waste management, but is not very well implemented or uh, are some lack in what means um, some uh, aspects in, uh, in different kind of materials in collection. And uh, we try to see if we can change the legislation because if you, right now, uh, how I said, we work on the, to, uh, on the Romanian strategy on circular economy to be uh, approved. And if this will be approved, we have, uh, the possibility to change a little bit the legislation in order to come with proposal uh, from developing new ways of, of from uh, collection, uh, the waste. And uh, in this way, we'll have the possibility to develop uh, uh, and to create new jobs in this direction. Uh, we have in this moment projects that are uh, that, uh, that are uh, developing circular economy and that are implementing these principles, but are some few in Romania, not so many. And uh, for this reason, we, we try it to develop this strategy in order to uh, come with some direction and to contribute maybe if it will be possible uh, to, to um, create these new jobs in circular economy. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Elena. And it looks like uh, we have uh, one question for, uh, I think for uh, Lakshmi. Is, is, I think there was a question, yeah. So, uh, and uh, once again, we request all participants, if they have got any question, please do mention in chat box, uh, because uh, we have finished our last final presentation also. So it's time to take up questions. So there's a question for Lakshmi Manor and uh, looks like that the question is from India. So uh, 
the question is what advice will you give someone who has an idea to reduce the waste and recycle the material but have no resources including people money infrastructure which is the first point to start from um have absolute i uh, clarity on what you wish to do with that uh, project um end to end you know um and you, there are so many uh, organizations um, support by supported by government and also there are so much of so a uh, uh, corporate social responsibility fund csr funds that is floating around so they are all looking for platforms or ideas or innovations with which they can associate to so uh, but the only thing is that you have to have at most clarity on what you actually wish to do with it and develop a prototype so that you know is somebody something that can be tangible somebody something that can even actually see you know they can touch and hold so that is actually the beginning of uh, that is how i had been carrying out things so when i say paper pen it will be strong it will be sturdy and all those things the until somebody actually holds it and tries to write with it they won't be convinced so mm. if it's a new idea you know develop a prototype first okay thank you so much lakshmi and uh, i would love to uh, know from our speakers participants if they have something interesting to share on this platform before we wrap up okay okay so uh, with this uh, we come to the end of our session uh, we thank you all speakers for bill, uh, for bringing their expertise and experience through this session and making it so engaging fruitful and constructive and we have had open exchanges of information thought processes also so we also thank our participants for their active participation interest and time we are coming up with yet another exciting webinar on april 12 so save the date and uh, please keep visiting www.ecocivilization.eu for further events and their details so thank you again for joining us today and we will see you next time till then take care and bye bye thank you so much take care thank you so much have a nice thank day you, and i'm great to meet you Thank you so much, Austin. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you so for much. this Bye opportunity. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Thank you. We can leave, right? Oh, yes, please, please, yeah. please. Thank you, Kanji. Bye bye. bye.